kid. Seriously. Welcome to a glorious return of the Kids Seriously podcast. We're the only podcast around that convinces you you are beaten and it's useless to resist. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel, who has no sister. And over here, it's Maya Madrid, who has Rachel. Rachel's my sister. Every so often we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars and other parts of the world that tickle our fancy, answer some questions that Kid Seriously got, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Today marks the beginning of the second season. A new name, new changes, a new rocket, a new planet. It's time to talk about our biggest change. In the immortal words of Jack Black and the greatest and best song in the world, look into my eyes and it's easy to see. One and one make two, two and one make three. It is destiny. Kid Seriously is proud to announce our newest host, who will be with us as time allows, in timing that has honestly been a long time coming. We welcome Mark Neitzel. Mark Neitzel, how are you? I'm great, thank you. I think that's the closest I've ever been to being serenaded before. (laughs) Well, I'm glad if it was anybody that could do it, it would be me. Because as our viewers and listeners don't know, I was actually friends with you before I was friends with Luke. And so now you're going to kind of take the role, the role in my life that Jim has taken in your brothers. Luke, what say you? In fairness, I was friends with Mark before you were. You were never friends with him. He picked on you, and I enjoyed it. Actually, we didn't. We got along fabulously. So yeah. this is a pretty good opportunity for us to gang up on you. Oh, that's not good. Well, what's going on with you, uh, Mr. Neitzel? I'm, I'm doing good, thank you. I'm really, really excited to talk about this cartoon that I just saw for the first time. Nice, nice. It should be a good one. Luke, what about you? What's new with you? I'm on vacation. So You're I'm, on vacation? I am on vacation. I'm very excited. You're on a staycation. Well, no, I'm going to Chicago tomorrow because oh. my, my son is a very big Dortmund fan, Borussia Dortmund, yes. and they are playing Manchester City at Soldier Field tomorrow. And what's Jim doing? He'll be thinking about me oh, okay. while while I'm there. And then it turned out we were also going to the Fire versus Toronto on Saturday. So we just decided to get a hotel and make a, a guy's weekend in Chicago. So I am not working. And if I didn't have a horrible cold, I'd probably be a bottle of wine down already. All right. Well, I have some kidney stone news for you all. Fantastic. That's yeah. exactly what I want to hear about your urethra. I know. I, was, I knew you were on the edge of your seat. So I wanted to let you know that I uh, have to eat more carbohydrates and drink more water. And I don't know how to feel about that. But I just want to keep everybody in the loop. One of the big storylines from season one was my kidney stone. And I just wanted to keep everybody abreast of how there are going to be no more kidney stones and we won't have to miss any more weeks. Which is too bad because I have a 24 pack of Coke that I was going to send you home with. And, and can I just say that that is the first time we've ever used the word big when describing anything about his uh, genitals? <laughs> you can say that. I'm uh, moving on. Gentlemen, uh, rumor... <laughs> get edited out. That's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> Rumors abound that J.J. Abrams is not a fan of the show. So we're not doing bumpers anymore in season two? Oh, are we not doing a bumper? Uh, Did you want to do a bumper? Were, but yeah. How about we... How long do I want to wait? How about we go to you? the news? Gentlemen, rumors abound that J.J. Abrams is not a fan of the show, did not take up our advice to return to either Naboo or Mustafar, as Luke and I recommended last season. Instead, the Episode 7 and Episode 9 director has chosen to return to the planet of Yavin 4, which you both will recognize as the strategic last stand home base of the Rebel Alliance in A New Hope that nearly went the way of the Alderaan in the climactic final battle. What you may not know is that Yavin 4 is the planet of one Poe Dameron. But didn't we see one shot of that place from a guard tower and the rest of it was just in a bunker or out in space? Yes. Well, yeah, so... we, we saw the garage of Yavin 4. <laughs> I just... I, I You could put it any planet. You could put it anywhere, basically, and say it's Yavin 4 like any of us would know. Right. And that that was actually filmed, I believe, if I'm not saying, in Guatemala. And I don't think they're actually returning to Guatemala. But J.J. Abrams is bringing us back to that planet that we saw two shots of and loved so well. I'm really excited for the part where uh, the the bad guys make a really big space weapon. And they're going to have to race against time before they can blow up Yavin 4. That would never happen. No. They already did that. <laughs> That'll be great. Um, 
So according to comics, this is the part you probably don't know about Yavin 4. I'm going to get real deep with you guys here in the comics lore, so if you'll just bear with me. Poe's mother, Shara Bay, accompanied Luke Skywalker on an adventure to find Force relics, and the pair found two Force trees. Skywalker gives one to Shara, and her and her family settle down on Yavin 4. And who, do, who knows what he did with the other one, maybe burned it down in The Last Jedi. In any event... Abrams goes back to Yavin 4, and what I want to know, and we'll start with Luke, is this decision the culmination of a complex weave of storytelling, or is it just fan service and nostalgia in an attempt to well, bring in people who loved A New Hope? Is this from a comic, or what is this even from? Yeah, that was from a comic, yeah. Oh, well, I don't really think it's fan service for a comic that's probably been out for a year or two. Well, going back to Yavin 4 in and of itself, rather than a great big universe that you could just pick anywhere, I think is kind of you know, a fan. But do, so, but has he officially said he's using these things that you're talking about or have no, you just I'm heard it in? I'm speculating. So you're speculating. Yeah, that's I'm what he speculating. Is. Oh, cause I'm, I'm guessing he's not going to use that. I'm, I'm guessing he just wants to show us familiar sets and familiar locations. So we'll get to see the abandoned garage that they used in a new hope. And we'll get to see the tree line that we know. And we did see a tiny bit more of in rogue one, but, um, I, I don't think he's going to delve into the, I don't think they're pulling stuff from the comics that just came out to, to bring into it. May, maybe there might be a mention or two, but I don't think it'll be much. Mark, what do you think? You have a very, uh, you, our, our listeners can't see your face. Uh, but you have a very confused look upon your face. I know I went deep right away with you into comics. Uh, what are your feelings on going back to old planets that we've already seen in the movies? Um, you know, I am not that excited about it. I am interested in new stuff. I've seen Yavin, what, four? Yep. Yeah, Have you seen I've, Yavin 1, 2, I've seen it three? in okay. two different shots in one movie, and it's fairly unremarkable. Give me something new. Give me something interesting. Give me anything. I mean, I feel like... 99% of the people who are in there aren't even going to know what Yavin 4 is. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't, yeah. Nope. No, thank you. Judging by your comments, is it fair to say that you're a bigger fan of Last Jedi versus Force Awakens? And if so, are you kind of looking forward to J.J. Abrams doing uh, Episode 9, or are you kind of apprehensive about it? Um, yes, I am a bigger fan of Last Jedi than I am of Force Awakens. However, I am a big J.J. Abrams fan, so, yeah, I mean, if he gives me something new, I, I like what he can do, I like a lot of his work, but I don't want to see Star Wars again, I don't want to see Empire Strikes Back again, I want to see something new in this universe. I, I tend to agree with you on that, Mark, like, I... I don't want fan service just to... I don't want to go back to Yavin 4 just to go back to Yavin 4. And I, I think... I want to believe that J.J. Abrams went in there and said, we're going to remake Star Wars. We're going to have all these callbacks. And we're going to basically, if you talk to Luke, make the exact same movie. And I think they did that so that they could, they could make people feel like they had ownership over this new universe. And my hope is that J.J. Abrams kind of spreads his wings in a, in a fashion similar in some ways to Ryan Johnson. I, I think I'm the, the lone duck, the lone wolf on this, uh, on this panel here who didn't care for The Last Jedi as much. But I think we're all kind of in agreement that we would like to, uh, to see something new. Well, and I think there's a difference between having callbacks to things yeah. versus just remaking things. So I'm fine if you go to planets that we've already seen especially if it makes sense to the story. It's just don't recreate the story. Right. That That's all I want. So I, I really don't have a problem if we go to Yavin 4. I, I personally like seeing it in Rogue One, but ha have a real reason to do it other than to just show us Yavin 4. I, I guess in, in response to that, I'd say there are so many planets in the Star Wars universe, and Yavin 4 is kind of very coincidental. It is the home of the, the Rebels, at the time in Rogue One and at the time of A New Hope. And it just also happens to be where Poe Dameron, the best starfighter, is from. And there are so many coincidences in the Star Wars universe when you talk about 3PO, you know, ending up with Luke Skywalker and, and having him being created by Anakin Skywalker. Like, the whole thing just kind of... It has to come natural. It has to be natural in the storytelling. And if it is, then I'll be fine with it. Yeah, but I think... Part of my problem with where things are going is that there's such a reliance on these connections and 
coincidence is that it winds up kind of hampering the story because they're not able to break free of this. And they've got to find a way to, oh, this can't just be the greatest pilot. He's got to be the pilot from the planet where they were originally based. And I, I feel like that gets in the way of them telling a more interesting story that branches out in new directions if you've always got to bring it back to the same core characters or places. Is it fear? Is it fear of making a movie that's not successful or turning people off? I mean, they tr- they tried it um, with The Last Jedi, and, and most people did. It did great at the box office, but there was a large segment of people who were not happy with it. Is it something? Is Disney sort of hedging? Well, yeah, of course Disney's going to hedge. Uh, I mean, that's a given. It's just a matter of how much they hedge. Um, and as far as the backlash... Uh, how much backlash is there really outside of Fortune outside of my Twitter feed Twitter <laughs> right really I mean seriously I you know I don't spend a lot of time um, looking into the minutia of Star Wars fandom and I if it wasn't for your podcast I probably wouldn't even know that there are that many people that upset about the last Jedi. What, what I really think it comes down to a question of isn't whether Disney is scared. It's it's how much how much they're giving to J.J. Abrams. Because the model that they have run, which is much different than the Marvel model, is they have given their filmmakers these properties and said, do whatever you want and let them run with it. So J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson didn't really consult on what each other were doing. I mean, Ryan Johnson asked him not to use Luke. But other than that, they did their own thing, and then Ryan Johnson took it in his own direction. My guess is the move to Abrams is a move they were comfortable with. It was a safe choice. Everyone loves The Force Awakens, and it made you know it's the highest grossing domestic movie of all time. So I don't think they're going to give it to J.J. Abrams and say, you have to fit within these guidelines. I think they're going to give it to him and say, just do do what you want to do, and we trust you, and you'll you'll do fine. And I don't think that J.J. Abrams is going to just remake Return of the Jedi. I really think he is going to try and do his own thing because I think he had learned some lessons from Star Trek about that when he basically did that with the second movie there and it didn't go so well. They wanted Force Awakens to be a reset to bring people back in that were upset with the prequels and then they wanted it to expand and I think that's what he wanted and I think that's how he'll take it. So I'm not overly concerned that he's going to go back to some of his old tricks. Now maybe I'm having trouble with the timeline a little bit and you guys could help me out here but do you think that the move to Abrams is more a fear of all the director problems they had on Rogue One on episode 9 itself with Colin Trevorrow <laughs> um, and in and I'm not sure with like the solo like how that all uh, did Abrams come on after um, Lord Miller left solo but they just had a lot of director problems so is it is it specific to that or is it specific to Ryan Johnson I would kind of argue it was specific to the other director problems as far as their comfort level why why does Disney need to feel comforted well I I I think it's they've had director problems and they love jj abrams and he did well for them and he seems to love them so why wouldn't you give it to someone that you like and trust and did a good job for you off the gate seems seems like a simple logical choice to me i mean let's be honest when these movies first came out and they announced that they were hiring ryan johnson we were all surprised that jj abrams wasn't doing all three movies anyway so i don't think that this is this is them being afraid of what happened with ryan johnson or with solo it's just we don't like trevorrow Abrams is willing to do it. We like him. He's in. Yeah. I also think, I honestly, it would be a good move just because it would create a coherent, or at least a more coherent vision between the three movies. Uh, with the other Star Wars trilogies, you had Lucas as the primary guest showrunner uh, to keep that vision going through in all three. And uh, obviously there was a pretty big disconnect in theme and tone between Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. So maybe from an, if Disney's actually considering the art of it, maybe there's a certain amount of wanting to bring him back and at least try and get kind of a consistency for the three movies overall. And that makes sense because you look at the moves since then and putting Ryan Johnson in charge of his own series, uh, uh, his own trilogy, and then... Um... Weiss and Benioff 
uh, doing their series of movies. We don't know how many of those. It looks like maybe they are looking for more of a, a continual flavor with that. So in any event, we have to move on because uh, Luke is giving me the hurry up and get to the next topic. We're going to go to our next segment, and this segment is Polynesia's favorite segment. It's sponsored by David Byrne, and it's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? Now, because we have two players, our champion, Luke, is going to need to face another human being, his brother, in an epic struggle that puts family members against each other in a battle to the death, not unlike the Civil War, both the United States and Marvel as well as the varying opinions of the greatness of Dinosaur's TV show from 1991 to 1994. Did you ever watch that show? I am familiar with what it is. You didn't watch it? I, no. I know not the mama. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Uh, yeah. I can't, unfortunately, Mark, I can't give you a point for that. We, uh, we haven't rung the bell yet. But here's how the two-player game is going to work. There's still seven questions. Our champion's going to go first in the first round. Challenger will go first in the second round and vice versa. We're going to do it like a serpentine uh fantasy football draft and at the end of each question the point will go to whoever is correct or if the answers are similar whatever answer i like better unless you're both wrong of course and then neither of you gets a point if there's a draw it's a draw it's like soccer there's no overtime okay we're not doing golden goal we're not going to go to extra time and play for penalties it'll be a draw okay to be the champion mark neitzel will have to beat luke neitzel Mark Neitzel, our challenger, in his initial bout. Mark, are you ready? Sure. Go for it. Our champion, Luke Neitzel, trying to bring that streak to three with an undefeated record of 2-0. Luke? Four. Is it four? It's four. I thought that might have been the case. Yeah. Sorry. So it's 3-0. Ready to go for it. Luke, are you ready? Sure. All right. Question number one. Luke will start. Mark Hamill has been sending funny tweets about J.J. Abrams casting an empty robe in the next film while additionally taking pot shots at Nimrods getting too bent out of shape about their childhoods. Luke, call your shot. Is Luke Skywalker in Episode Nine as a Force Ghost? Yeah, I said that last week I, when we talked about it. He'll, he'll 100% be in it as a Force Ghost, and he just likes having fun on Twitter, and he's funny on Twitter. So he's going to stir up whatever he can. But I have absolutely no doubts with J.J. Abrams behind the helm that he will, he will be there as a Force Ghost 100%. Mark, what say you? No, he is going to have a stroke in November of this year and be unable to film. <laughs> wow. Originally, I had yes, but I'm going to go with Mark and give him the point for the creativity. That was, uh, I didn't see that coming. So Mark is up one nothing. Early lead for the challenger. This question goes to Mark. Boys, DC United is in the dumps. Despite opening Audi Field with great fanfare, the team sits 13 points behind Montreal for the final spot in the MLS Eastern Division. All is not lost, however, because Wayne Rooney himself has suited up for MLS's historic flagship franchise and helped inspire a 3-1 victory with his superior passing and his general English strong-willedness, whatever that means. Additionally, DC has a whopping four games in hand over Philadelphia, whom they trail, and six more games to play than either Montreal or uh, our beloved Fire. Mark, are DC United going to rise from the dead and play like they did against Vancouver and make the playoffs, or was last weekend a one-hit wonder to make us all forget who DC United really is? What say you? Uh, Point of clarification, is Ben Olsen still the coach? Yes, he is. (laughs) They're going nowhere. (laughs) They're done. Yeah, I mean they're they, they'd have to they'd have to score it they have to pull like two point one points a game in order to get that which is historic pace to win and I'm sorry Wayne Rooney is not enough Mark you've watched enough Everton to know that Wayne Rooney isn't going to be what pulls you out of this that doesn't make your defense better that doesn't uh, I mean they beat Vancouver who had to travel as far as anyone had to travel to get there and is one of the most uninspiring teams to watch ever. So I, I'm not going to take a lot away from, from that win. I mean, Cincinnati probably would have beat Vancouver on that day flying over. So, uh, no, this is, this is not a team going anywhere. I am not. Rooney is half a step above re-signing Freddie Adu. Nice. Well, I don't know. He played pretty well in his first game. So I think I'll bid the Vegas lights for that. Here's uh here's what I'm going to say. 
I'm going to award the point to neither of you. Not because I don't agree. This team is not going to make the playoffs, but they will play a lot better and a lot better than each of you are saying. So the score remains 1-0 to Mark. Question number three, this goes to Luke first. Hasbro is coming out with a special toy set of Chewbacca and the Porgs. And as soon as it was announced, the squeeing of young Star Wars fans could be heard from time zone to time zone as they took a short break from drawing pictures of Raylo. But that's not what I'm going to ask you about. Guys, in all of Star Wars history, what was the best Star Wars toy? The best Star Wars toy? Well, Mark had most of the better ones. Um, but the the one that it, that I loved was I had the, the Rancor. And he, his mouth opened just wide enough to fit the like the legs of a on the, another Star Wars guy. He couldn't get the whole thing in the Rancor, but he could at least chew the legs up every time. And it was pretty badass. Mark? I would like to point out that I also had a Rancor as a child, but I didn't break the arm off of mine, so um, in, in, mine is still in better condition. In fairness, Luke cut the arm off of mine. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, no, I am going to go with the Dagobah system playset because it had the foam um, quicksand that you could disappear your characters under. And you had to be clever beforehand and set it up on the edge of the table so that they could actually go all the way through instead of just hit the bottom and, you know. So, yes, the Dagobah system. So if you if you had the foresight to set it up on the side, you could put the character all the way through and disappear. Uh, otherwise, if you had it on the table, then you would just stand and be like a waiting pool. You each have better answers than what I had. Um, I think it's very clear that you had parents who loved you a lot more than I did because I just had the actual action figures. I didn't even get, like, spaceships or much less a Rancor who I could tear the arm off or Dagobah. Uh, my answer was Lobot followed by Wedge. Those were our favorites in our family. I'm going to give this point to Mark because I had never even heard of the Dagobah system playset. So he's up 2 nothing. And we're almost halfway through. Are you getting nervous yet, Luke? Oh my god, the stress. The stress. This next question goes to Mark. He's ready to take a commanding lead here. The actor for Rogue One's Darth Vader went to Topeka, Kansas to talk to school children about bullying. KSNT of Topeka said famous Star Wars actor Spencer Wilding has himself been the victim of bullying. Gentlemen, which Star Wars unknown would you like to come to your place of business to give an uplifting talk? So it has to be an unknown. Who, who's going first? Uh, this is to Mark. Hmm. Well, if I can only have one person, I want Jabba's Dancing Slave Girl. Oh my god, it's Nine Numb. I want the guy who played Nine Numb. He, he's like the best, man. He just He's still alive, by the way. I think. And he was you the great... Clearly different criteria that we're basing this on. We definitely are. Plus, I, I just want to know how big that guy's ears are in real life. <laughs> I'm going to go with the slave girl. I'm sorry. Maybe maybe Mark is just talking to the, the hedonist in me. The misogynist. Uh, I guess you. so. But, I mean, so it goes to Mark. He's up 3 nothing. Luke must run the table here, getting questions 5, 6, and to salvage the draw and to end at 3-3. Three, three. If Mark gets one more, he wins. Question number 5. In Philadelphia, the city's orchestra will be playing the music from 1977's A New Hope in front of a screen playing the movie. While Ro in Roswell, a city near Atlanta, they plan to hold an open-air showing of The Last Jedi for free for all the people. Guys, which one would you rather be at? A New Hope or Last Jedi Luke? Oh, the orchestra thing is awesome. I went to uh, the Milwaukee Film Festival does that once a year with old silent movies. And uh, last year they did Metropolis, which I think is the best movie ever made. It's not my favorite movie ever made because it's kind of hard to get through because it's very long. But they did it with a, a live orchestra, and that experience is insane. Like, it's it's so much fun. Um, much more fun than, than just being outside for a movie. I mean, that's still a good time, too. But if anyone, even if it's any movie you have mild interest in, can do an orchestra experience for a movie, it's amazing. Mark? I'm going to protect my lead and also go with the orchestra. Okay, but Luke gave a better answer. I'm going to go with him, and it's going to be 3-1, so he's crawling back in it. 3-1. Mm. to one. Lead in favor of Mark. 
we go to this is Mark's question first, right? Yeah, because yep. we had the new home. Three to one, guys. Cinema Blend ran a story on how comics tried to answer the question about why Grand Moff Tarkin would have outranked Darth Vader in A New Hope. I'm not overly concerned with the answer that the comics provide, but instead with the your answers as to why this might have been. Why was Grand Moff Tarkin in charge of Vader? Oh well, I think it's obvious. Vader got his ass kicked on Mustafar. I mean, he's chopped in half. He's barely a man. He's probably still screaming, no, over Padma. So he can't be a pretty reliable, you know, right-hand man at this point. Plus, you know, you look at the end of Return of the, or Revenge of the Sith, and Tarkin's there. So he's obviously been around for a while, and obviously the Death Star is progressing along nicely. So he's getting shit done. So... I think it's pretty obvious that he would be uh, outranking Vader. That that answer is way too overly complicated. It's very easy to summarize. It may have been my mission, but it sure as shit was the Chief's boat. I had George Lucas never expected that Darth Vader to be as important or well fleshed out as he was, so he just made him a henchman. I'm going to give the point to Luke... Probably in the interest that I want this to go down to the last question to see if he can keep his title. And we're going to see how many episodes I can do that one movie quote in. That's true. That's true. So we're going to say it's three to two. It goes back to the champion to try to tie it up and salvage a draw. Here we go. Our final question comes from the realm of international soccer news. With Cristiano Ronaldo's 100 million euro transfer to Juventus now complete, the biggest transfer chip has fallen in the World Cup shortened transfer window. Predict the next biggest transfer that happens this summer. Well, and I'm going to assume then we're not going to talk about the the world record goalkeeper move that just went down. Oh, the Al- the, the Allison, Allison to, to Liverpool. Yeah, that was, so then I, I'm, I'm, a big, I'm a big believer that the, the package Hazard-Courtois deal to Madrid is going to happen by the next time we record. And it's going to be sweet because Chelsea's going to suck and it's going to be amazing. Mark? Uh, Mbappe to Madrid. Oh gosh, you guys are going to throw too much money at him and it's a done deal. PSG, PSG don't need the money. So here's the deal. I want to give it to Mark because Mark is new. I want to see Luke get beat. But the first rule is I have to go with the correct answer and as you can see, Luke, Eden Hazard to Madrid is what I have, so I have to give it to Luke, unfortunately. I really wish I'd given him, I would give him Mark answer six. So by the skinniest of margins, in sort of a, a bullcrap sort of way, you keep your title to 4-0, and but we have some, some protestations. Mark? It, it's not a protest at all. I just want you all to know that given how much I care about Real Madrid, I'm fine losing on that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the deal. Uh, since you lost this week, Mark, the plan is to have you write the questions for next week, and the juggernaut will go against the untested, unproven, unheralded, and probably ungood at this particular game. I'm going to enter the circle and go and try to knock Luke off of his perch. And we're, we're just going to hope it's a Tales from the Crypt-themed episode. That would be really you short. You just totally stole my line there. Nice! <laughs> <laughs> That's why it needs to Crap. be that. You're not giving up a point for that, are you? <laughs> Should sure. we get to questions that kids seriously got? Sure. All right, we got Jed from Florida writing us another soccer question. He says, okay, are we sure the Argentina job is a good one, or is it weighed down by declining talent and suffocating expectations. Luke, do you want to take this one first? Sure. I actually think the biggest problem with that is just how inept and corrupt the Federation is. I just wouldn't trust them. They have trouble playing, paying their players. I I think if you are the level that of coach that they would seek out, you can also find a much better, more stable, secure, less nutso Federation to work with. So I wouldn't particularly let that be my pick. Now, maybe... If I was Argentina or from Argentina and had more connection to them emotionally, maybe that would seem more important. But as an outsider, I I think I would want to find something a little better. Mark, what are your thoughts on Argentina just generally, and if what the deal with them is? I, I think that could be a good stepping stone 
for an up and coming coach. Um, I don't know that they would hire somebody like that, but I could see somebody coming in doing four years, trying to get a modestly better result than this last go around and then immediately turning in their papers and trying to move on to somewhere else. I, I could see a lot of coaches wanting to, to take the job in that spirit. But I don't think anybody's looking to take it and be there for you know three four cycles. Yeah, and I think too you could see the the only way I'd see it is if I mean it'd be like being the guy who it'd be like being Joe Madden, right? You know, the guy who got the Cubs to win a World Series finally. If you actually do go in there and make something out of the mess that they've been recently, then you'll be remembered for forever. But it's wading through all that garbage to get there. So do you th- do you guys think it was bad coaching then that was their problem this time around? I I think he was by far the worst coach at the World Cup and the worst showing by a coach they made up there. I don't think coaching was their only problem there by a long shot, uh, but I, he certainly did everything he could to make it worse. Yeah, I agree. That's a hot take, I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Jed, hey, thanks out there for sending us a question. Reminder, if you got a question for us, you can go ahead and hit us up at kids seriously or send us an email at kids seriously radio at gmail.com doesn't have to be an email we'd love to put it on here let's go ahead and talk about the clone wars season two episode one holocron heist a lesson learned is a lesson earned just like 311 would have wrote it Written by Paul Dini of the Batman animated series fame and directed by Justin Ridge, who brought us rookies and also brought us the Gungan General, Holocron Heist is all about trying to deal with bounty hunters as our heroes chase Cad Bane and Ahsoka finds a new threat. Mark, you have a comment, it looks like. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, before we even get started, that this is the first Star Wars on TV that I have seen since Ewoks the Battle of Endor in 1985, so I'm really coming in cold. Now, I hate I hate to, you know, deliver a spoiler right away here, but I'm dying to know which one was better. Mm, ask me that again later. All right, Luke Knights will take it away here, buddy. Well, obviously it was Caravan of Courage, but... Uh, <laughs> so th- this, one, this one starts out pretty quick. It's a short opening narration, and we have a, a, a little bit of a space battle with uh, some clones trapped on a planet, and uh, Plo Koon is leading a space battle, and it's a pretty good opening space battle, and obi Kin are together on the planet surface doing their thing, and they're on a planet called Felucia, mm-hmm. which was, wow! Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> After I got done giggling like a schoolgirl because it's close to fellatio, I started thinking about Felucia in and of itself. So they're getting more obvious with their metaphors here. But we, we have the opening battle there, and basically what's going on is they're being overrun, and they need to get out of there. What I like about this part in this whole episode, really, is we have lots and lots of returning characters from the prequels. We have Plo Koon, Obi-Wan, Anakin, Ahsoka, the whole Jedi Council, Jocasta, Aayla Sakura, and Darth Sidious, and that's when I stopped listing them. So do they do this whole Starship Troopers ripoff at the beginning of every episode? Yes. Okay. And I, I find it, I, for the most part, though, I think it's pretty helpful, because a lot of these stories, they just kind of chaotically throw you into a battle. They don't lead from one story to the other in most cases, so you do need a little bit of where we're at. Now, the the blue writing generally has zero meaning to what's going on and is apparently getting worse and worse as we move on. Um, Bones on the move. Would you like to know more? Exactly. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they're, so they're trying to get evac out of there, and Ahsoka's off fighting her own little battle and doesn't want her to retreat because she's winning hers, despite her orders that tell her to go. And apparently she didn't learn lessons from all the other episodes where she disobeyed orders and got everyone killed. Um, but Obi, Obi can go and land in front of her, basically, and force her to leave so that they can get off this planet. And um, it, it's an interesting opening. 
I liked the, the, the shaky cam and the color scheme. I didn't think it was overwhelming blaster fire that normally bothers you. I have it. I have Return of the Pew Pew. Oh, okay. So it was overwhelming blaster <laughs> fire for you. But it, it it moved briskly, which I thought was nice. Um, and then the episode basically completely shifts tone. So Ahsoka has to answer to the Jedi Council. They're back on Coruscant. She basically gets punished with the most important duty they have. One thing I want to I want to say too before we get too far away, when you talk about uh, Felucia and you talk about how they represent Coruscant and later Cad Bane, the visual you can tell that they put a lot of effort here into the season one premiere. The visuals are really a step up compared to what we saw last season. Mark, while we're talking about the visuals, I'm, I'm going over my notes here, and have we brought up the fact that uh, the Jedi are typically depicted wearing lots of you know monk type robes or you know they've got some armor in this and yet the teenage girl is fighting in a tube top yeah look, oh yeah you want to talk about that a little bit yeah and actually this is actually a step up because when they originally debuted her in the movie in the first couple episodes she was wearing a tube top and mini skirt so oh. about three or four episodes in they actually gave her pants and luckily we know we're working our way to a full outfit at one point but there, there may be some some regrettable errors in some of the things Star Wars has done as far as its representation of women and its representation of, I don't know, thinly veiled ethnic minority <laughs> stereotypes. So Yeah, get used to it, man. That's yeah, a drawback. That's kind of kind of what happens. Um, as long as it's not just me. Nope, it's not just you. So she gets she gets punished with the basically being put in charge of guarding the most important secrets that the Jedi have, which, okay, that's fine. Um, so she goes to the Jedi archives. She gets a tour of the holocrons, which are the top secret information that only Jedi are allowed to go in. We see the librarian who is featured in uh, Attack of the Clones. She's the one that tells Obi-Wan that if something's not in the archives, it couldn't exist because, you know, no one could have erased it, even though they, they did. But anyways, I digress. And then we cut away to Cad Bane, who is returning from the last episode. This is completely unrelated to Zero the Hut, thank goodness, speaking of stereotypes. Uh, and he is hired by Sidious to steal a holocron. And uh, he takes a lot of money and what to do it, because it's the, the hardest thing that can ever be done. And we know immediately how hard it is, because Yoda immediately senses that someone's going to steal holocrons. Okay, um, I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but... Right when he's feeling a disturbance in the forest and he's making that kind of pain face, there was a little low bass line that played in the background. And I swear to God, the first time I saw it, I thought he was having like a bowel movement. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds I, about right. I did not notice that. One no, thing that I. Watch it. it's, it's there. One thing I did notice about that moment, it made me think of The Last Jedi and how lots of people freaked out how Luke Skywalker could force project himself over all those miles. And we saw people who could see into the future, but never see what was happening in the Star Wars universe as it was happening. And this is a total like nod to that, where like Yoda could just predict what's happening as it's happening. And I, I just yeah. kind of thought making up force powers on the thing is kind of like a Star Wars... We're used to in the Star Wars universe, and so I don't yeah, know everybody well, freaked out. you know, blood parasites can do a lot of stuff when you let them. <laughs> so... So Cad Bane's got a droid named Toto, who he is reprogramming in some way, but we don't really know. Oh, we know. We know. And then he he assembles his team, which is just another person, which is a, a changeling named uh, Kato, I believe. And uh, they have a map and a security pass to get through the Jedi Temple. And the changeling, they have a body of a Jedi, which I thought was kind of a fun little touch. So when the changeling touches the body of the Jedi, she turns into him. And that is how they are able to infiltrate it. And obi Kin are then put in charge of searching for the intruder because they know they're coming um, to steal steal the knock list, we find out at the end. But anyway, uh, Ahsoka is guarding, and she runs into Kato, who is dressed as this Jedi, not realizing it, but he's kind of a dick to her. And uh, Kato sends Toto to a weak point in the shield so that Cad Bane can break in, which he basically does by sticking his hands in it, which is a little odd because I don't know how, how a shield would work like that, but it's a kid's show. So the, the scanners freak out. obi Kin and Yoda know exactly what's going on. So they run out to find them. And Kato attacks the old librarian lady so he can become her and kind of, or so she can become her, I guess. So she can, she can change around a little. 
Meanwhile, Kane continues our, or uh, Bane continue, and Kato kind of continue our Mission Impossible theme as they have to go through laser wires to to lower through the, they go through the ventilation system to go into a room that's protected by laser wires and drop down and, and steal stuff. So they're in the air ducts. Kato and Ahsoka have a lightsaber fight, which is a relatively interesting fight because it's more ninja style than we've seen in previous battles. Like, there were some kind of innovative moves, but I still wonder how Kato got, well, maybe they, I suppose they got the dead Jedi's lightsaber, but I was a little disappointed that he could, he or she could hold her own with Ahsoka. Yeah, this reminded me a lot of Finn in Force Awakens, and I wanted to see uh, the, the bounty hunter fight like Finn, where Finn is still successful fighting with the lightsaber, but at the end of the day... When it's somebody, when it's, when he's going against another force-powered character with training, uh, Kylo Ren whips the floor or wipes the floor with him. That's what I wanted to see Ahsoka do, and I thought this was a little overpowered. I think this was though we needed three more minutes, so we we had him. But at least they it was made a the good fight. fight. Yeah, it was yeah. a good fight. It was entertaining. Uh, Bane's still having trouble getting in, and he sends Toto to the communication center, which is where all the Jedi are, basically to just get him murdered. So it'll be a nice little uh, distraction. And uh, he kind of tricks Obi-Kin to follow him, and that allows him to access the holochrome vault where he is able to steal what he needs. And Toto is captured, but he is uh, a bomb, and that's what he was reprogrammed with. And uh, in case you were curious, they do program droids to cry before they are about to die, <laughs> which is an interesting way to do it. Say, holy shit, was that intense for a kid's show. Yeah. yeah. I was not expecting that at all. I mean, I... I figured, okay, this is kind of one of those in-between, you know, kid shows with something for the adults, but I was just stunned and was actually a little upset considering how they kind of developed him up until that point. And this is not the first time that Justin Ridge has done this uh, in the series. In in Rookies, he had the straight-up murder of a couple clone series, tr- or I'm sorry, clone war, clone troopers. Um, and, and the sort of, the, the sort of shock and awe of, of clones dying or characters dying is, is something where at the beginning of season one, they really struggled with tone. I think they're really starting to, to even out a little bit, but they're kind of evening out on the dark side. Wait, you, you found this episode as evened out in tone? No, evened out in tone respect, in respect to other episodes. Where this is becoming a very dark show, where it used to be up and down, where there's like happy Clone Wars and really kid-friendly stuff, and then really dark stuff, sometimes within moments of each other. The the, the famous example is there's probably the third or fourth episode where uh, Plo Koon is, is out there in space with, in disabled ships, and the droids have these kind of can-opener droids that are going and, and opening up the ships and sucking all the clone troopers into space, and you have... Literally, you have these guys that are stranded in one of these ships, and the can opener is slowly opening their ship, and they all are realizing they're about to die, and they're screaming, and they're crying, and being sucked out into space. And it's really, it was really semi-devastating and uh, amazing to to see them doing this in a kid's show. And it finally, the crescendo hits, and the clone troopers fly out and are killed, and then the droid troopers are immediately like, there he goes, zip, zip, wowie, like making jokes. And I... It's it's something to be in that writing room, I would think, to to put that all together. We've come a long way since every single Cobra troop is able to parachute out of his plane. <laughs> yeah, it's slightly different. That is for sure. They blow up Toto. Uh, Kato's been subdued, but Bane still has the holochrome, and he is able to escape in a Jedi robe, which m- leads me to believe they didn't even need to bother with this other changeling. Why didn't they just throw a robe on and walk through the front door? Because apparently that worked. That's all you need. Yeah. But uh, they're basically, Bane is going off to find Bola Rapal, who is a Greedo-like Jedi, way out in the middle of space. And basically what we find out is the holochrome is the knock list. It is a list of all the kids they have identified as Force users that they want to bring in. Jedi babies. Jedi babies that they want to bring into the Order. So Bane is basically going out to uh, murder them. So it's, you know, I suppose you're looking at uh, Mission Impossible from the Soviet side. <laughs> Maybe we're not all good guys. So, Mark... Yeah, th- Bane, man down. Exactly. Mark, <laughs> They're this- dead. They're all fucking dead. Mark, Mark, this was your first ever Clone Wars. Just overall, what did you think of this episode? Um, you know, so I, I, I really thought about it, and I really tried to come up with something interesting or unique or, or thought-provoking to say, and honestly, I, uh, another hot take here for my first time out, but it was just a meh. It... 
it was all right. Um, I, I there are some things in it I really liked. Uh, that Kate Bain design is awesome. That's yeah. a guy I want to see more of. Um, like I said before, I was really shocked um, in a good way by when they killed our two Wally. I thought that was <laughs> uh, that was really interesting, but it, it was more of a kid show than I think I thought it was going to be going in. And I don't know. I mean, I'll watch it again for this podcast, obviously. But if I was just some random guy up at two in the morning, um, found it on Netflix, I don't know that I would watch it again. Yeah, I think this this episode was relatively routine and kind of felt like it was going through the motions. We we've seen other ones that have kind of been setups for other episodes, and that's clearly what this was. And I, I take some positive from the fact that what I've kind of wanted is a larger connected universe and maybe some longer plot threads rather than kind of one-off things that are quickly resolved. So this could be setting that up, and I like that it, it made the universe feel bigger. Like they have this other Jedi who manages younglings in a whole other part of the world. Um, so there, there are things that I like that I think are going to push the overall arcs forward in the direction that I kind of want the whole series to go as a whole. But this episode in and of itself is not especially entertaining. It's just another episode. It's one that I will not remember two weeks from now when we're talking about it. From my perspective, I, I obviously I have to rank this number one because it's the first episode of the second season. I think if it had come in the first season, it would have maybe been the top third of episodes for me. And here are some of the reasons why I really like the visuals. Anytime we get Ahsoka, I really like that character. Even though, as you said, Luke, it's kind of she's kind of hitting the nail on the head over and over again with her not learning, which is kind of irritating. But I think she's a far better character um, and has shown a lot of improvement since we first saw her in the in the movie. I also like the visuals. They spend a ton of time um, when we first see Cad Bane and he's sort of behind the blinds with his big, uh, you know, Western hat. Uh, just a great character. And they really put a lot of effort into the visuals there, into what Coruscant looks like. We really see like a filled world that we don't always see in some of the episodes from the first season. One of the issues that I have with it is I, I could really could have done without the first laser battle that really served no purpose other than to say, look at all the things that we can do. The texture of the of the visuals was really good, but it really didn't serve a purpose. And kind of like you said, it, it this is an episode that sets up a lot. Now, from the people that I've talked to, this is when the Clone, the Clone Wars series starts to get good in the second season. And so I'm excited by it. I probably give it a lot of credit because it's setting up things that I've been told have been really great. But at the same time, it's not one of the upper echelon like rookies that Justin Ridge did before. Go ahead, Mark. I just want to say something else that really bothered me, and neither of you touched on it, and I'm going to make sure this gets in there. Why exactly did that changeling, as soon as it caught, decide just to spill every single detail yeah. to and including, you know, his, you know, Kate's pin number? I mean, <laughs> it took nothing. It didn't even threaten her. They didn't. You know, make about oh, we're going to put you in jail. I mean, you didn't stick a lightsaber near her face. It's just oh, by the way. Here's everything that's going to happen that you need to know. I'm actually wondering if this is a thing with the changelings, because if you remember in Attack of the Clones, when Anakin catches that changeling that tried to kill Padma, that changeling was about to tell him everything until the dart from Jango Fett hit it in the throat and killed it. So, actually, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe it's a consistency among changelings that <laughs> they just... Or, may, or maybe these, this criminal underworld just knows what stone cold killers the jedi are that they'll just you know they were she probably knew she was about to have a hand chopped off at least one so they're ready to just let it go here's my guess that's what they needed the story to do so they just kind of went with it but it is frustrating because how hard would it have been to just use a mind trick on her that would have took an additional five seconds to get her to do it and uh, you know you talk about what was the point of the opening sequence the point of the opening sequence was to make ahsoka guard that room which, again, could have just been part of her normal duty. So maybe take out that opening sequence and maybe develop some of the details of the story you're really trying to tell rather than just adding on longer longer action sequences. But you can tell that the budget must have doubled yeah. in between seasons. Do you yeah, think... and I, I think those two plot things, that the one I brought up and what you just said, are really kind of the biggest things that worked against the show for me is that they were such easy fixes within this universe that 
it, it just it felt a little lazy and it felt a little like okay we're writing a kids show so I don't have to figure out a creative way to get Ahsoka into that library um, or to get that information out other than just a straight exposition dump. Now this is written by Paul Dini who did uh, Batman the Animated Series. I don't know if any of you or either of you watched a lot of the Batman the Animated Series, but did you find that sort of thing going on in that show? I never did, but I watched it when I was much less critical and much younger. Well, and that's that's what I'd say too is is I haven't watched that show in twenty years, so I I can't really tell you if it did or didn't. And and just because he didn't do it in that, I mean, you know, I I imagine they have a mandate that says you need to have this much action, so they had to have an opening battle sequence in it. Rather than having it be, you know, talking exposition about, Ahsoka, you, this is your rotation to guard this area, etc., etc. And they're probably under time constraints to pump out so many episodes. So I bet the, the short route ends up getting taken, and we all know that leads to the dark side, the quick and easy. So, so yeah. There's a joke in there, but I'm not going to make it. How many pews you give it? Uh, I'll give it. I'll give it two and a half. Right in the use. middle. It's, no one will remember it. Neither will we, because we're moving on. On to the next one. We're in other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Mark, this is the segment where we ask you about other parts in your life, other nerd stuff that you are into. Uh, we'll start with Luke here. What other nerd stuff has got you going this week? Well, well, first off, we should have probably led with the fact that they announced they're making new Clone Wars episodes, 12 new episodes. I didn't see that, man. I've been kind of busy. Holy cow. They announced that today. They're going to be making 12 new episodes. They don't know when they're going to launch, but they're going to be on the new Disney streaming platform. Oh, so. great. But it could be over a year before they come out, so we'll have to crank through these episodes. But other than that, I saw um, Ant Man and the Wasp this Did last you? weekend with Jim. Of course, yeah, it was it was good. Uh, I enjoy those ones. I you, like the plot is ridiculous. It makes no sense and it's relatively dumb, but they're just fun to watch because you don't really care about the plot in those movies. That's not the point of it. Uh, I I thought Evangeline Lily's Wasp is awesome. I wish they would have done more of her, because as much as they want to call it Ant-Man and the Wasp, it's still Ant-Man featuring the Wasp. But she does an awesome job. I love the fact that it's it's a female character that does not need anyone else. There isn't a single situation that she probably, that she even really needs him for. Like, he, he probably doesn't even need to be there. She could probably do everything they need, which even Black Widow, you know, ends up having Captain America have to save her, or whatever. So I thought that was cool, and it, it was also kind of nice to have a Marvel movie where the whole galaxy wasn't at stake. Hmm. Like, it's just lower stakes, it just affects the people. I don't think people will remember Ghost, but it was still a, a better villain than I think we're used to. I would kind of put it with the the Baron Zemo-type villain, where it isn't going to steal the show like Loki or Thanos or Vulture, but... It, it makes sense, and you understand that character's motivations for why they're doing things. So, I, I liked it. Excellent. I'm going to go next, uh, because basically, I've just been watching Game of Thrones. Um, I'm in the third season, so nothing exciting has really gone on in my life other than that. And I don't want to talk about it, because I don't want either of you bastards to, to let me know anything about it. So, for me, I've been listening to some Jethro Tull, and that's been nice for me. And if you're out there and you like Jethro Tull, or you like the flute, hey, go for it. Mark, what things have you been into? Just Jeff Lortel is my favorite, my favorite, what did they win the Grammy for? Metal band? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, they're my favorite metal band. Anything that makes Lars sad is okay in my book. Well, well said, well said. Okay, so, um, I don't know if you saw this yesterday, Matt Groening did an interview with the New York Times where he waded into the whole Apu and Ospia and Petalon controversy. Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, hmm? I said, goodness gracious, I, want, I hope this is going in a good direction. I think so. Um, so, and of course, he, like most liberalish white creators who make some problematic art, he put his foot in his mouth and talked about how he thought people were being outraged because it's a fun thing to do these days. And it was a lot of nonsense that you come to expect. And But of course, it's on the topic of uh, diversity and representation in art and it is something that I think about a lot and it segues nicely into what I got yesterday which was Marvel's volume 9 of G. Willow Wilson's Miss Marvel series uh, do either of you know who that character is? yeah it's um uh, don't tell me I heard I, 
Oh, I, sh- I know her name. I'm assuming it's not Carol Danvers since... No, no, it's... it's, it's Captain Marvel. That's it's Captain Marvel, Marvel. okay. It's, okay. She's in love with uh, the the uh, Morella Spider-Man, doesn't she? No, no. They they are in a comic together, but no. no. I can't remember her first name. You gotta, okay, tell me now. Okay. Is so it Kamala? It's not Kamala, Marvel is it? Kamala is Kamala Khan. Okay. 15-year-old, uh, second-generation Pakistani-American. And, you know, she's your typical 15-year-old. She's dealing with boys and puberty and coming of age and also with the conflicts between her parents pakistani traditions and that of you know her life in america and through a whole plot thing we don't need to get into one morning she basically wakes up with superpowers and so she becomes kind of like in the vein of spider-man a a crime fighter um but it's it's really fantastic because it's written by this woman, G. Willow Wilson, who, um, even though she is a white woman, she um, lived in Egypt for many years. She married a Muslim man. She converted to Islam, and she came back. And so she has a really firm understanding of both American culture and sort of you know the, the Muslim culture of what it's like to you know, have to straddle those two worlds. She's an excellent writer in general, and it's just, it's a wonderful kind of the representation that we need that Apu is not. It really gives us uh, different perspectives, different ways of looking at the same problems, and... Maybe some actual uh, accurate portrayals of minorities that aren't just written by white men who want to assume they understand what the experience right. for an Ameri- for a minority is right it doesn't start out as a stereotype that we then try and flesh out in order to not feel bad about what we did it starts out as a wholly realized real character and it's so it's not only refreshing in that but it's also refreshing in that you know so many of comics is recycling the same tropes and the same characters and this is obviously a redoing of spider-man but whereas spider-man really is kind of motivated by guilt And sort of, well, I have all this power, so I have this responsibility. Um, She really kind of approaches it more as a gift, as this allows her to be the hero that she always wanted to be. And so it's it's a lot more positive. It's well drawn. It's just fantastic. And it's the kind of thing that I would recommend to everybody, people who don't read comics. I know if I had a daughter, this thing, this book would be in her crib. Um, I just can't say enough about it. And volume nine came out yesterday, so I'm rereading volume eight to make sure that I'm up to speed on where the thing is before I start in on it, hopefully tomorrow. Well, you got a niece who likes superheroes. Mark, let me ask you two clarifying questions about Miss Marvel. And I was I, I kept having uh, Kamala Harris in my head in my head and I realized that wasn't her name. It's Kamala Khan. Um, her powers are similar to Mr. Fantastic, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's basically exactly the same. Um, except they do a bit more of a healing factor with her in that if she's using her powers to get injured, she can kind of condense back into a regular form and they can heal quicker. And the other question that I have is, and you kind of talked about, you didn't get into how she got her powers, but is she an inhuman? I had heard yes, that. Yes, okay. she is. Um, that gets into the whole... Uh, Infinity event and the Terrigen bomb and Marvel corporate's attempt to replace mutants with Inhumans because right. they didn't have the movie rights and that's just that's all secondary and you don't really need to know anything about it. Well, what other was dis- basically a strange mist gave her superpowers? What was what was and, and maybe I just don't understand Inhumans well enough because okay. I don't care because my my group is the X Men, but. Aren't they from, like, the moon? Like, is she actually Pakistani, or is she from the moon, or how is that... that the so Terrigen Mist is how they get their powers, I know, but... So, so, basically, millions of years ago, the alien Krees began doing experiments where they were combining their DNA with different other animals and horse and fish people that they found on other planets and um, to try and create perfect soldiers. And so, obviously, they experimented with people... And that created a breed um, called the Inhumans that for a long time, they were a small clan, basically, that lived on the blue side of the moon, which the blue side is the only part of the moon that has oxygen. 
And what happened was, through again a long series of events I don't want to get into, the leader of the Inhumans decided to release a bomb that would spread these mists all over Earth that would give anybody who had any trace of inhuman DNA in them superpowers. So she's a Pakistani American. She's so she's literally a Pakistani. Yes. So basically, from millions of years ago, in her lineage, the the Kree inserted some DNA, and so when these myths got released, it triggered her powers. Okay. So. And that was my misunderstanding because I thought she was actually from the moon and somehow just came to this family, and I kind of wanted her to be Pakistani American. So I'm no, glad that you cleared that up for me. She is, because like I said, this whole plot was basically Marvel's idea of right. recreating mutants with a brand that Fox didn't own. Yeah. So they tried to make it as close to the mutant phenomena as possible. So. Hey, speaking about something that Fox doesn't own and that uh, Disney doesn't own, it's us. And unfortunately, our time has come to an end. Luke Neitzel, where can the uh, the adoring fans contact you at? At Luke underscore Neitzel. And Mark Neitzel, do you have a way that fans can talk to you, the newest star of the Kids Seriously podcast? Uh, after the performance I'm sure I put on tonight, I don't know that I want anybody contacting me, so, no. If you want to contact Mark, you can just do it through the normal means. Uh, as for me, I am at Maya Madrid, and we are all three kids seriously, and we're out of here. Wait, for Whoa, wait. Can I say one thing? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity, and I, I hope that in 20 years, when they're doing the oral history of Kids Seriously, I am not referred to as the show's Gucci. <laughs> no, your cousin Oliver. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at kidsseriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.